Welcome back to World History. This will be your last lesson on Chapter 18, the Industrial Revolution. Uh, today we'll be finishing up with uh, such topics as challenges to Christianity, as well as the new trends in the arts. So let's begin with challenges to Christianity. We already talked about last time uh, the growth of well, science as the new faith to believe in. Uh, we talked about evolution. We talked about how people began to reject faith in God for faith in progress. Well, there were other things that arose during this time that also threatened Christianity. Number one, liberal theologians. Liberal theologians simply are people who deny certain parts of the Bible as untrue. Some in the church no longer accepted the inspiration and inerrancy of Scripture. Instead, they tried to scientifically discern what portions of God's Word was true and what was false. They believed that Christianity slowly evolved out of the Near Eastern civilization. For example, they would deny the idea that Moses wrote the Pentateuch. They claim that the prophets wrote their prophecies down after the events that had already occurred. And of course, any miracles that might have happened in the Bible, they would reject. Number two, the social gospel. The social gospel believed that the ultimate purpose of man was to change society for the better. By changing society, they believed that individuals would improve. They denied the fact that the only salvation is a personal salvation. Number three, there was a growing materialism and secularization of society. Many people began to concentrate on the things of this world and to neglect spiritual things. I've talked about this with you guys in other classes um, Satan always attacks Christians in two ways. The first may be physical persecution, but if that fails, Satan attacks Christians with material prosperity. What's better than destroying Christians? It's making them useless for Christ. And growing materialism was becoming a real issue during this time. While church membership remained high, church attendance began to decline. The church, especially in Europe, weakened by worldly Christians, lost its influence on the lives of Europeans. And lastly, the fourth challenge to Christianity was the exaltation of man above God. That's humanism. We discussed humanism before, but that was a simple study of man in general. In the 1800s, we get the humanism that we're most familiar with today. Modern humanists accept evolution and the social gospel and believe that man was not made by God, nor is he responsible to God. After all, if God didn't make us, we don't have to listen to his word. That's the view of a humanist. Although a very small group in society, they held a huge influence and will continue to grow by the beginning of the 20th century. Letter C, new trends in the arts. Remember, art visualizes what people see as important. This chapter will talk about a couple different forms of art at the end of the 1800s. The first one is called realism. Realism had a growing awareness of the world around them. They rejected romanticism and wanted to portray life as it really is. That's kind of the best definition I can think of, portraying life as it really is. Uh, one example of an individual who was a realist author was Charles Dickens, 1812 to 1870. Dickens was a social critic who attacked injustice in society through his vivid portrayals of such places as industrial slums and debtor prisons. 
Uh, let me read on page 409 the indented paragraph to you, uh, giving you guys a description of the imaginary city of Coketown. It was a town of red brick, or brick that would have been red if the smoke and ashes had allowed it. But as matters stood, it was a town of unnatural red and black, like the painted face of a savage. It was a town of machinery and tall chimneys, out of which interminable serpents of smoke trailed themselves forever and ever, and never got uncoiled. It had a black canal in it, and a river that ran purple with ill-smelling dye, and vast piles of buildings full of windows where there was a rattling and a trembling all day long. That description probably does a decent job at describing the real cities of Europe. Dickens' realism stands out best in his story, Oliver Twist. But he's also wrote other books like A Tale of Two Cities, Great Expectations, David Copperfield, and of course, A Christmas Carol. Another author was a man by the name of Thomas Hardy, who lived from 1840 to 18, 1928. Hardy portrayed man as engaged in a hopeless struggle against impersonal forces beyond his control. Another realist was Samuel Clemens, more popularly known as Mark Twain. Mark Twain believed what Hardy believed, but he usually used humor to convey his ideas. Leo Tolstoy. He lived from 1828 to 1910. Uh, he was a Russian writer. He realistically described Russia during the Napoleonic Wars. And of course, he wrote the famous and huge novel, War and Peace. One more individual we'll mention was Gustave Courbet. He was a realist painter. He said that an abstract object, invisible or non-existent, does not belong to the domain of painting. He also once famously said, show me an angel and I'll paint one. In short, Courbet only painted things that he could see or were, quote-unquote, real. If you look at page 409, it shows you an example of one of his works called The Grain Sifters, uh, if you could look at that as an example of his works. So that's realism, painting or telling it as it really is. Number two, Impressionism. The French came up with Impressionism. It abandoned realism and emphasized light and color to emit a response from the viewers. One more time, it abandoned realism, emphasizing light and color to emit a response from the viewer. Uh, a couple individuals, or a few individuals that we'll mention, um, Auguste Renoir and Claude Monet are two examples. They're the most famous French impressionists. Uh, those are some examples of their works. Also, if you look on page 410, it shows you another example of his work, of Renoir's work, called Luncheon of, of the Boating Party. Another individual was a man by the name of Auguste Rodin. He was a famous Impressionist sculptor. His work did not look realistic, and most of his works were not finely polished, but had an unfinished look to them. His most famous sculpting was called The Thinker. Hmm. One more individual we'll mention was a man by the name of Claude Debussy. He was largely responsible for the Impressionist style in music. Lastly, number three, Post-Impressionism. Two individuals who were involved with post-Impressionism was Paul Cezanne and Vincent van Gogh. They believed that Impressionism had rejected too many traditional artistic concepts and advocated a style that emphasized universal themes to outline more clearly the figures in their paintings. Cezanne painted nature in geometric shapes. He'll eventually be the uh, forerunner of Cubism. Van Gogh distorted the figures in his paintings in an effort to portray the intense emotions that he felt toward his subjects. 
He would later be the forerunner of another style called Expressionism. For, well, the end of the week, please make sure that you do page 165, 166 in your activities book. That is the chapter review that you need to do. That will help prepare you for the upcoming test. Also, for the rest of this week, you need to make sure that you review and take the chapter Six to, or chapter 18 test as well. Uh, if you have any questions or concerns, please email me or uh, Skype me and give me those questions that you may have. Hope you have a good rest of the day. Be good, do good. Bye.